Yamato won his fourth Winston Top Fuel Championship in 1991, but fell to Kenny Bernstein at the Winter Nationals just three weeks ago. John Force won his second consecutive bunny car title last year, but ran into rookie Jim Epler at Pomona, and his day was over, a day Jim Epler and family will never forget. Scott Jeffrion has taken the wheel of the dominating Dodge this season, but former boss Warren Johnson had his number in round two at the season opener. They're all here in Phoenix this weekend, champions and challengers alike for the Motocraft Ford Nationals and Firebird International Raceway. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Evans. This is the championship top fuel dragster of Joe Amato. These are the men that have helped wrench him to four Winston Top Hill Championships, one more than any other man or woman has ever captured. Joe, the season three weeks ago at Pomona didn't get off quite the way you wanted, but still an exciting race with Kenny Bernstein. Yeah, it was a real close race. When you lose by 9,000 of a second on reaction time, it's, uh, it's a tough way to lose, but we were one round ahead of where we were last year, so we're off to a pretty good start, and the car is really running good. We ran three 489 runs out there. I mean, and uh, we've got a fast car here. Out of 18 national events, how many will the champion have to win, do you think? Uh, four or five or six, depending on how many runner-ups you get. I mean, it comes down to rounds and how many other people do it. I mean, uh, every round is real important. 200 points, and it's a long season yet. Go get them. Thank you. Earlier, we talked to some of Joe's competitors on their thoughts about his fifth championship. When you've got that kind of experience with Tim Richards and the crew and the driver he is and everything it takes, and four world championships behind you. You're not gonna beat them in one race. It takes a whole season to do it. They'll be very hard. They're an awfully good race team. They're a class act, but there's a lot of good race teams out here this year. And I think they're gonna have their hands full. No, I think we get a little sick of seeing him win the championship. Uh, but, uh, you know, that happens. When I, when we won it four times in our funny car. People got a little sick of that too. So obviously uh, we all wanna knock him off. And uh, he's gonna be tough though. You know, he, he wears the title quite well and that's, that's a shame. Did you love Perdome's comment? He wears the title well, and that's a shame. That was Vintage Snake. Well, that's the top fuel story. For funny cars, well, let's go to Brock Yates. Well, Steve, a big pair of drag racing slicks like that carried John Force to his second consecutive world championship in funny car. But I'll tell you what, things are going to get maybe a little bit tougher this year. Started out at Pomona, John, with uh, a young guy coming down from the Pacific Northwest, Jim Epler, and uh, really waxed you pretty good in the finals. Big surprise. Well, you got to give uh, credit to him and his crew chief. Uh, I didn't even know who he was. Uh, I was kind of more interested in his kids. It was a, it was a great show, uh, but he took us out, and that goes to show you anybody can do it. Well, this season uh, seems to be uh, getting real tough. Uh, competition continues to escalate every year in Funny Car. Quicker, faster, stronger teams. Well, they are, and I'll tell you, one of the guys that, that's laying back and their trouble with problems is uh, Cruz kid uh, driving for Larry Miner, that McDonald's car. You know they got big bucks down there. They got Lee Beard. Uh, that car is going to be tough. He's the one we're watching right now. Okay, well, there are a bunch of guys in the funny car that are going after John, and I'll tell you what, uh, we checked around and found out what they have to think about the man. He's pretty good on everything he does out here, and uh, he's tough to beat. Epler's looking real good now, but... I think over the long haul, John Ford's going to be right back up there, and he's going to be the one to chase again. Well, our goal is to be consistent and not try and uh, go for low ET. If we can stay running in the 20s and not hurt a bunch of parts and stay, stay within our budget, I think uh, we'll have a good shot at it. Well, I'll tell you what, if those guys have anything to do with it, a third championship is not going to be that easy for John Force. And now, for more on the Pro Stocks, let's go to our pal, Big Daddy Don Garlitz. Thank you, Brock. I'm in the Wayne County Speed Shop pit, and this is the Dodge driven by Scott Jeffreyon. This car has dominated NHRA Pro Stock Racing for the last couple of years. Now, in the first outing at Pomona, Scott Jeffreyon did fair. He was defeated in the second round by his former boss, Warren Johnson, but he got him off the line. It was down course that Scott had a little bit of trouble. Now, earlier, we talked to the competition of the Pro Stock drivers, and they have other plans for this car to stop the domination in 1992. I look, all last year, that Dodge was uh, rampaging all over this country, and uh, this year, I hope it's us, because we've been running well, and I hope we can last all year like that. Well, it's going to probably be difficult for everybody out there. I mean, there's so many cars running extremely close right now. It's not going to be a one- or two-car battle as it was last year by any stretch of the imagination. I 
see probably six, maybe as many as eight cars being able to battle this thing out towards the end. Well, Scott, obviously you want to keep this car's winning ways. What are your plans for 1992 to accomplish this? Uh, I'm just going to go out here and do a you know real good job, I think, for Mopar and Dodge. And uh, I think it's just a matter of building some chemistry amongst our personalities on the team here in the beginning, and I think everything will gel just fine after that. Well, thank you, Scott. Well, there you heard it, Steve. All right, thank you, Big Daddy and Brock Yates. Uh, enough talk already. Let's make some noise. No machines in the world make more of it than top fuel directors. This is round number two here at the Motorcraft Ford Nationals. Eddie Hill versus Gene Snow. There you see Gene Snow. He's been running fairly well. He had a four-second run three weeks ago in Pomona. But the man everybody is talking about here is in the bright yellow car, Eddie Hill. He did not qualify at Pomona, just asked crew chief Fuzzy Carter. But they came in here, the first dragster down the racetrack, Don Garlitz, and set low a lap time at 493, and it's still old. That's right, and he's going to be very tough to beat. Snow has not run all that well here so far, but you know how it is with the snowman. He is capable of stepping up at any moment, but he's always wanting to fiddle with that thing and make changes, and of course the crew hates that. Of course, I'm sure that Hill hopes that now he's made some kind of a change on it. Well, in round number one, Eddie Hill defeated Kim LaHaye. As we said, he's the number one qualifier, low ET in the event. Gene Snow, well, he got by a blower banging Ed McCullough in round number one to uh, get to this point. And there you see Snow. He knows uh, Brock Gates that he's got to go for a shot here. Hill's not going to be easy to beat. Well, yeah, Eddie uh, and the crew came in here very disappointed from Pomona, so they've got a lot at stake to uh, prove that they're up amongst the uh, top contenders at Top Fuel, and it is much question that they aren't. But what, Pomona was a disaster for them. Good race. Gene Snow with an advantage. Gene Snow upsets Eddie Hill. 5.05 seconds to a 5.08. A heck of a race. Speed of 275 miles per hour. Let's have another look at this one. It's certainly worthy of it, Don Garlitz. Well, it certainly looks like Hill was on the ball as they leave the starting line. A slight advantage to Hill, but uh, Snow was right there. You know, as they move down course and we see Gene Snow's car just pull out just a little bit, it makes me think that maybe Hill was not taking Snow seriously and didn't have enough horsepower. Let's go to Brock Yates down at the far end. Well, Eddie, a real, real close race against Gene, uh, an 08 to an 05, and as low qualifier, you got to be a disappointed man, but a great show, a great drag race in any case. Well, yeah, that was a, a very close run. I couldn't even tell for sure who won. I knew it had to be about that close. Uh, Gene's an awful good friend of mine. I'm good to see, uh, glad to see him win one. That was a tough one for us after coming in number one, but uh, evidently something went wrong. We'll have to go see what it was. Your little prior in the top end, is that what happened? Uh, it just felt a little weak all the way through. I don't know what the problem was. We'll just have to go back and look at the computer and figure it out. Well, it was a great show anyway. Congratulations on low ET of the meet and qualifying anyway. Thank you. We sure enjoyed that part. Congratulations. Thank you. We've got upset potential here as well with Doug Herbert, who ran so well at Pomona against Joe Amato. Oh, absolutely. You're looking at 24-year-old North Carolinian Doug Herbert, who unofficially is the quickest driver this sport has ever seen at 4.88 seconds. He's in the mail order speed equipment business, the Hugger Sportswear car. He'll be up against, well, this guy needs no introduction. He's the four-time champ, Joe Amato, from Old Forge, Pennsylvania. Now, even though Herbert three weeks ago set that 488, Amato put him out of competition in round number two. I think the young man is still stinging from that. But you know, Amato can't forget that 488 at Pomona. That is a very, very strong run, and he knows that Herbert's got that down in that bag of tricks somewhere. Now, Amato only qualified one position ahead of Doug Herbert, a 498 to a 499, but that was a couple of days ago. The track, the weather, a lot of things are different than they were then. Amato in the near lane, the four-time champ. Herbert. Amato loses traction, tries to stay with it, finally has to throw in the towel, and Herbert gets a bit of revenge over the Winter Nationals at 501. 269 miles an hour, Amato slowing to a 616. Let's go to Don Garlitz back at the starting line with crew chief Tim Richards to see if he knows what happened. Well, Tim, what, what happened? You always get that clutch just right. Well, we were worried about this uh, tailwind we got here. We, we find we lose about uh, 450 pounds of downforce and we were up as far as we could go the whole race here, and I was definitely worried about it going in here, but sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. I know what you're talking about. Wind always bugged me. Oh, yeah, the wind is a big big factor when it comes up. Thanks. Thank you. And the wind is indeed up. Let's have another look. Over the far lane by about two thousandths of a second, Doug Herbert was off the mark first. Joe Amato had a lot of clutch in the car. You could see it dangling the front wheels ever so slightly. 
right there when another stage came in. It was just too much for the racetrack here in Firebird. Maybe any racetrack. Well, Joe, it's just one of those deals. Uh, you lay down 5,000 odd horsepower and they're bound to get away from you once in a while. Yeah, the wind is blowing pretty good here and it might, you know, make the track. It got a little hotter and the uh, car left real good. You know, had the wheels in the air a little extra hard and uh, got out in the middle and just started rattling the tires and blew them loose. There's nothing you can do then. It, it, uh, uh, there's nothing. Uh, once, he, once you blow the tires loose, you know, I tried to pedal it back one time, but then he was making such a good move sure. I gave up on it. It was hopeless. Well, great drag race. Congratulations. We know we'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Okay, Kyle, thank you. All right, Joe Amato on the trailer. That's rare in round number two. All right, the next pair both had huge problems at Pomona three weeks ago. This man, Michael Brotherton, ended up on his top when the parachute failed uh, through an engine fire, and the car could not come back. It was too badly damaged. Don Perdon would have loved to have been in round one, two, three, or four. He did not even qualify after great testing numbers uh, during the offseason. But Perdon has come back with a vengeance. In fact, he's qualified back around one. He ran a 4.94 last time. All the snake has to do is repeat that, and he probably will go to the final four. Michael Brotherton, brand new on the Gerald Gwynn racing team out of Plantation, Florida. He places Frank Holly in the cockpit of that car. A guy with a lot of experience, ran his own cars, too cheap for jeans. No, he's good. Done a good choice. You're right, Steve. And you know, Perdome really stepped up in that first round with that uh, 494 because he only qualified number 14 with a 515. He was getting a little bit nervous. Maybe he wasn't going to qualify at this race, too. Absolutely right. He made it at the very last session yesterday. Perdome in the near lane against Brotherton. And it is Perdome who smokes the tires even earlier than Amato. That has got to give him some concern over the racetrack, particularly that near lane. Brotherton, 499. 281 miles per hour. But the one thing Michael's going to have to look at is reaction time. It was just terrible as compared to Prudhomme. Okay, here's an interesting pair. That is Jim Head, and he will go against Pat Austin. We know about his transition from top to alcohol funny cars to uh, into top fuel competition. Of course, he's still doing well there in the funny cars as well. So this is a dual effort on Pat's part. Jim had an interesting story, always innovating, always trying, lost to Bernstein in a close race at the Winter Nationals, and he is always tough, Big Daddy. Yes, he is. He's subject to run a four-second run at any moment. In fact, he lost with the four at Pomona. Pat Austin, Tacoma, Washington, qualified number two here. Only Eddie Hill was quicker to 496. And earlier today, in round number one, he met up with Kenny Bernstein. Bernstein, like Perdome, was troubled in qualifying, barely made the field in the 15th spot. So Austin was... Well, a favorite, to say the least, when the two squared off earlier today. Now watch Austin. He will leave the starting line first and never relinquish that lead. Even though Bernstein certainly upped his performance for qualifying, it wasn't enough. It was Austin at 499, a big speed of 287.90 miles per hour. Now his opponent in round number two, Jim Head, he had a interesting and rather scary first round encounter. He was up against Corey McClanathan. Now watch Head's car in the far lane. The huge left slick explodes off the wheel thanks to good driving and a couple of parachutes that kept the car straight. Jim Head remained upright, but some damage was done to the car, especially when a piece of tire hit the wing and just ripped part of the tubing away, Don Garland. They got a lot of work to do in a case like that. Thank goodness there's welders at the track to take care of those situations. So here is the head car in the near lane repaired and hopefully repaired properly, Rod. With that wild color scheme of uh, Jim Heads over in the far lane, the Pat Austin automobile in the Castro livery in the lane that so far has been by far the most successful here. Identical reaction times. Head gives a great effort, but it's not quite enough. Pat Austin, five seconds flat. He too falls off a bit from the first round, 286 miles per hour. Jim had a 514 at 268 miles per hour, shutting it off just a little bit early. So, Big Daddy, let's have another look. Well, young Pat Austin takes a very slight starting line advantage, not enough to really make any difference. The real difference came in that uh, Walt Austin prepared engine. As they move down course, you can just see the car developing more power every step of the way and a very nice victory for young Pat Austin. So that sets up the final four here in Phoenix. It will be Pat Austin versus Michael Brotherton. Brotherton has the lane choice with his 499. The other pairing will see Doug Herbert up against Gene Snow. And of course, Herbert has the lane choice a 501 to uh, Snow's 505 from the previous round. Again, let's go to Brock at the far end. Well, Pat, in 08, uh, 
pretty stout crosswind and everything uh, kind of looking a little cranky, but I'm sure you're going to want to step that up a little bit. Yeah, I think you just got to take it round by round and, and uh, you know, give it the performance that it needs to get by that round. And, and we thought that, uh, I think we plan on running, you know, like a five, low 5 oh, That's a little bit off pace, but the, I think the track is causing that. We're getting into a little bit of a dust storm here, and that's got something to do with it. Okay, go get them. Hey, we're going to. Thanks. Onward and upward. Hey, Brock, find some shelter down there, will you, buddy? It sounds like the soundtrack from Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> the way it's blowing, nobody's going to have to worry about ironing that flag. Stay with us. We'll be back to Phoenix. Round number two. And there is the two-time Winston champion, John Forrest. And there you're on board with him. You see the big stove pipe in there to relieve pressure. Should he have a blower explosion, not blow the body off of the car. Right, Don? You know, in my opinion, Steve, that's one of the trickiest innovations that uh, Austin Coyle has come up with in a long time. Those bodies are very expensive, but more than that, it is a safety feature for the driver. Now, listen to this. His opponent, Tom Hoover, has the lane choice over Forrest. Was qualified number one, picked up a $4,000 bonus. Don't worry about the body coming up over there. That's a normal routine. But he fell off in round number one, and Hoover picked up tremendously with a 5.26 second lap time. He's got lane choice and has selected the four side. That's been the favorite so far in elimination. John Forrest, of course, well, the best known clinic driver in the sport right now out of Yorba Linda, California. Austin Boyle is wanted crew chief. He's got everything it takes to win another championship. All he needs is that hard-to-find racing lot. Well, I'll tell you what, he's probably very concerned about that 526 at Hoover turn because Hoover runs a conservative operation, and you can bet he wasn't blowing up parts to do that. Oh, absolutely not. So John Forrest up against Tom Hoover here in round number two, the Motocraft Board Nationals, the winner to go to the final four. Look at Hoover. Hoover absolutely trounces John Forrest. Few have done that. A 5.32 to a 5.46. At the starting line, Don is with a crew chief who has to be scratching his head. Well, it slowed down. Boy, it sure did. Slow down big time. Uh, we've been fighting a little supercharger problem. We got to put a different one on every run. For whatever reason, it dropped the cylinder big time and uh, it didn't pick it up. That's the end result. Let's have another look at it. You'll see that John Forrest in the near lane. He knew Hoover would be tough, so John was very alert on the lights. Yeah, he takes a nice starting line advantage, and it looks like he's going to run pretty good, but we'll notice the fuel coming out of the left side of the car, and that means a cylinder is going away. And as the cars get down toward mid-track, Tom Hoover has already begun to take the lead. We'll see a flash of flame will come out of the left side of the car again, meaning the cylinder is not firing properly. Isn't it interesting that Cole could tell that from the starting line, Steve? Yes, it is. Let's go to Brock. John, they're going to remember this day as a day of upsets. I mean, all the heavy hitters have been falling like 10 pins here. Just a, a weird set of circumstances, and you're the next one to go. All the superstars kind of falling by the wayside. Well, they, they really are, and I'm really kind of lucky because uh, Epler had me in the points lead, went out. Uh, uh, same as myself, but uh, give credit to, to Hoover and Pop Hoover because... Uh, they outran us. My car fell off for whatever reason, but uh, we're excited, and uh, then we're a good bunch of guys over there. So if they can win, myself and Castro, Jolly Rancher, we're all just happy for them. Well, that's great, John. Uh, I'll tell you what, that's what makes this sport so good is that every time two guys come to the line, you can't ever tell what's going to happen. Yeah, that really is. And uh, his car made a move, and it drove away from me, and my car wasn't shaking. I knew I was in trouble. I was hoping I could drive around him, but... Uh, that Hoover family is a great family, and I'm glad they won. Well, congratulations. Great, great sportsmanship on your part. And the Hoovers, led by 86-year-old George, are as popular as they come within this sport. All right, here's the beautiful new entry from Larry Minor Motorsports, Cruz Pentagon in the McDonald's Oldsmobile. And quite a contrast between that operation and the one of Johnny West, Don Garland. Yeah, Johnny West is a true competitor. He doesn't have very much budget, but he really likes to get out there and race. Got a little shop right here in Phoenix. He does his very best. And getting some help from a former boss of his, Roland Leon. Let's go to Brock. Well, Tom, super pass. 32, uh, beat the champ and beat him real good. I'll tell you what, it was nice and the uh, car is uh, running great today. No problems at all. Just looked like a real clean pass all the way. Actually, I, I thought John might smoke the tires. Who knows? I took a percent out of it. There's more there yet. <laughs> good job. Go get it. Tom Hoover, I think, just a little bit stunned for them to be going to the Final Four. That's a, a little bit different than uh, last year, of course. Everybody guiding their funny cars back in the exact tracks in which they burned out. That's why you do a burnout, is to clean the track, heat up the tires, and put some rubber down. It's a warm afternoon. Cruise Pentagon have the air conditioning on. They shut it off now. 
This is only Cruz's second race as a professional. He won a number of titles as a sportsman driver in the alcohol ranks. Johnny West, Chandler, Arizona. He's driven his own cars. As we said, he's driven for Roland Leon. He is just a real popular, always upbeat guy that loves this sport. You know, he really helped me out, Steve, that time I crashed here in Phoenix. I used his shop to completely rebuild my car. I remember that. He has stayed up all night, all week, if that's what you needed. All right, Pedregon and Johnny West, the local versus the newest car on the circuit. Pedregon over the far lane, Johnny West in the near lane, nobody uh, in a big hurry to stage. Oh, Pedregon explodes an engine, and the body is now cattywampus on the car. Very close to the same thing that happened in the same round at Pomona just three weeks ago. Cruz is all right, but Big Daddy, that was spectacular. It certainly was. That was a much bigger explosion than the one at Pomona. I was standing near both of them, both times. This one was much larger. Well, I'll tell you, now you see the reason why uh, John Force runs that big stovepipe inside the car. It's if this kind of thing happens, it vents some of that out of there without unlatching the body. This is a very expensive proposition. Watch as Cruz Patrick on the instant he stepped on the throttle. The car didn't move two feet. It put the rods out the bottom, the blower off the top. That's as expensive an incident as you can have with a funny car. Let's go down to the starting line. Uh, Don Garlitz will try to console crew chief Bernie Federley, the man that has to put it back together. This is the second time we've seen this happen, Bernie. It must really be frustrating. Oh, man, I can't begin to tell you how bad it really feels. You know, we thought we had the solution to our problems. Made some subtle little changes after first round, and apparently aggravated the problem again. Man, this is a toughie. It is tough. I mean, there's a lot of damage here. A lot of good parts went down the drain. Boy, I'll say, and you know, or, uh, you know, it's just a real grim deal. It's one of those things that can be prevented. We just haven't figured out how to do it yet. Uh, we thought we had some direction going. We were real confident, but apparently, uh, apparently, it told us we didn't have it solved yet. Well, we wish you the best, Bernie. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, Johnny West won the race with a rather slow 6-18, but that sets up the final four. Tom Hoover versus Johnny. Hoover has the lane choice by a tremendous margin. The other half of the final four, Richard Hartman versus Gary Dencher. You guys got to be pleased to be this far. And the lane choice will go to Dencher. Now we're on board with Scott Jeffrey on and the Dodge Daytona out of Wayne County Speed Shop. He's now the driver of this machine, has been since the opening race three weeks ago. And it's taking a little adapting on Scott's part. He comes out of the longer wheelbase Oldsmobile car. This is a very tricky machine to drive. It likes a perfect racetrack, something you seldom get. Jim Yates, boy, what a smile he had on his face, even though he lost in the final round to Jerry Ekman three weeks ago. It was the first time the man from Virginia had ever gotten that far. This is one of the tough cars in the sport right now. Jeffrey on, still a little bit of an unknown quantity in the Dodge. His reaction times, however, have been sensational, as they were when he drove for Warren Johnson. So Jeffrey on uh, in the near lane, uh, you're inside that car, and you see his hand resting on the shifter, the five-speed transmission. Could be a four-speed in this car. They go back and forth a little bit. Motors come up to about 8,000. Sidestep the clutch, and the race is underway. Jeffrey on pulling those handles. Jeffrey on is all over the racetrack and into Yates's lane. Yates wins it at a 7.43, 186 miles per hour. We talked about the short wheelbase of that Dodge. That might have bit him here, Don Garlitz. And no telling what it was. Jeffrey on had a beautiful starting line advantage. Almost a perfect light. 404. Just four one thousandths off of a red light. You can see the Dodge is definitely in front of Yates, but then something begins to go wrong, and I guess it was a handling problem. He moves over toward the center line. He has to back off of the throttle. That lets Yates go ahead, and a good thing, too, because then we see the car make a violent move to the left, and it hits the cones there at the 330 mark, immediately disqualifying him and giving Yates the win. And in our next pair, we see the Pro Stock automobile that carries the Castrol colors, and that, of course, is the man who finished number three in the world last year, Mr. Larry Morgan, driving his Oldsmobile. He's up against yet another Oldsmobile. This is Don Beverly, who has filled the seat vacated by Scott Jeffrey on when he moved to the Dodge team. Beverly, of course, over the last decade, really, has built his own Pro Stock car, and now is uh, joined forces with Warren Johnson. Obviously, still awaiting some kind of corporate identity. They keep it refrigerator white. Don Beverly beat Jerry Haas in round number one with a 7.30. Now for Larry Morgan, he qualified number two at a 7.24. 
beat Harry Scribner in round number one and comes uh, into this race with the lane choice but has selected the near lane. The pro stalkers often like a different lane than the nitro cars. That's right, Steve. Sometimes the pro stalker just needs a real good starting line, but not near as much in the middle as the nitro cars. Now we see the longer wheelbase Oldsmobile of Larry Morgan goes right through that same spot that gave Scott Jeffy on problems, but Morgan's got another problem. It's called Don Beverly. Beverly on a hole shot. 736 with Morgan, 732, 186 for Beverly, 188 for Morgan. Wow, what's the car in the far lane? Yeah, watch Beverly take that starting line advantage. He knew he had to move hard with Morgan having the lane choice, meaning he had a better performing car. But there again, in the middle of the course, the Morgan car began to fall off just a little bit in performance, and it allowed Beverly to take the win, even though he only had a 736 to Morgan 732. But the hole shot was over 600 of a second, and that, as you can see right here, is significant. The win, the margin, 209,000. Boy, that's pretty good pro stock drag racing here in round number two, so let's, what the heck? Let's keep on going and bring up the next pair. It's going to be a man who is on a roll, Jerry Ekman, who three weeks ago won the Winter Nationals, and that is the yellow car in the near lane. Actually, a neighbor of Larry Morgan's up there in Newark, Ohio. He'll go against Frank Iaconio. Frank Iaconio, over the years, up and down in his career, uh, in this race against Ekman, who is on a streak. Ekman has lane choice, has a team backed up by Bill Orndorff's operation, and I'll tell you what, this Pontiac Trans Am right now is really hooked up, Don Garlitz. Well, Ekman with a 722 to Iaconia 726 is like light years in pro stock racing. I mean, he could just leave almost any time he wants and win. Ekman, the number one qualifier at 720. His opponent in round one, Kenny Delco, red lighted a foul start for Delco. So Ekman really hasn't had an opponent yet to take him all the way to the finish line. Could be different here with Iaconio. He's a good lever. Iaconio also leaves too soon. So Jerry Ackman, when you've got that kind of performance, you tend to scare him to death, and they gamble on the tree. So far, Delco and Iaconio have lost. Jerry Ackman, a 726, good speed. 191 miles per hour with four barrel carburetors, pump gasoline. Well, I'll tell you, the pro stocks are storming. To the point it's hard to get them stopped if the chutes don't come out. Okay, back at the starting line. That is Bruce Allen on board the rare Morris Illumina. He will face Warren Johnson, who just laid down a 7.20 in round one to put away Joe Lapone. Warren Johnson right now, based on performance, I think is the man to beat. But as we have found out, Don, anything can happen on that starting line. You're right, Steve. The cars leave so hard, 8,000 RPM, they can lift the wheels out of the lights and actually red light. But Warren Johnson has won dozens of titles, but never the overall championship. That, again, is his goal. Bruce Allen, well, the same could be said for him. Now, this team really struggled in 1991, but they've tested a lot offseason. We've seen a tremendous gain in performance. If it doesn't happen here at Phoenix, it will somewhere down the road. That car and driver combination are back big time in national event competition. We'll see who leaves the starting line first. It is Warren Johnson. Johnson by a tenth of a second. And Bruce Allen says, uh-uh, I'm not even in this one. 729, Johnson pulls off of it. Big speed though, 190 miles per hour. Well, eight went down, only four will come back and they'll pair off this way. Jerry Ekman against Warren Johnson. Ekman will have the lane choice. And in the other half of the final four, it looks like this. Jim Yates against Don Beverly. Yates continues his performance in national event competition, but Beverly will have the lane choice. It doesn't appear to be a big factor among the pro stock cars. Well, here the thrash goes on, and it's a family one with his sister and his dad and all his friends helping out Richard Hartman from Southern California. You're in the pit area of Jim Yates as they prepare that pro stock automobile to face Don Beverly when the pro stock final four rolls around. But it's not quite time for that yet. First of all, we've got the Nitro Vernon Fuel Coops to get through their final four. There is Rhonda Hartman backing up her brother, Richard. Richard is going to be up against Gary Densham, a pair of, uh, well, let's call them, I guess, budget funny cars, Don Garlitz. They're certainly not uh, guys that uh, are shot with diamonds. You're certainly right, Steve. Uh, both cars run on very limited budgets and therefore have to be very conservative in how they tune these engines. But that has not been a disadvantage at this racetrack this weekend. 
No, it has not, but these two have sent some of the big trucks packing. So Hartman will be in the near lane, Denjum over in the far lane, and this is kind of a pick as far as I'm concerned. I don't really see a favorite, do you, Brock? No, it's, uh, although Denjum uh, has been uh, pretty consistent, Hartman, as we both know, has can have some problems. Uh, he has uh, tested a few walls over the years, and uh, let's hope he uh, has a good clean run this time. So far, so good. Denjum smokes the tires and gets loose. Hartman barely beats him. Richard Hartman, a 585 to a 588. It wasn't pretty, but it was the closest race of the day. And there goes Hartman out into the desert with a parachute failure. Richard seldom has an uneventful run. I'm sure he'd like to change that even more than I would. But they'll just drag him out of the sagebrush, and he'll be ready for the final round. He said, hey, I did it. Doesn't matter how. Let's go down to the starting line with Don Garland. Well, what do you think about Richard's job there? I am so excited. He deserves it so much. He's in the final. I know. He's worked hard for it, too. He's worked till like, midnight getting that car ready. And it's just incredible. This is great. Well, we wish you the best. Thanks. She's a licensed drag racer herself, soon to be at the wheel of a blown alcohol car. Let's watch this one again. It's pretty strange, Vic. Yeah, we see Dencham take a nice hole shot, and it looks like he's on the way to another victory, and there comes the telltale smoke. The car loses traction just out about the 330 mark, and that gives Hartman the advantage, and he begins to move ahead. But you know, Dencham backpedals it and almost saves it. Unbelievable drive by Dancher who stayed in it. Tell you, Richard, you look more like a sprint car driver than a funny car driver there for a while. Yeah, I had that thing skating all over the place down here. That was one weird race, but you stayed with it. Tenacity won that one. Yeah, um, my car was shaking and moving, and I stayed with it, and then it popped at about three-quarter track, and I was just, I was hoping he wouldn't catch up, and I heard him come right by past the lights, but I guess I won, so that's great. You bet. Good drivers never give up on the quarter mile. Without question, the closest and uh, wildest drag race of the day. As we get ready to go to the second half of the Final Four in Funny Car, this is Tom Hoover coming to the line against Johnny West, a low-budget operation, uh, but West, local favorite and a kid that can always win a big drag race, Steve. Talk about never give up. Now, you got to pick a favorite here. Hoover, based on uh, his runs throughout qualifying in the first couple of rounds today, except for that engine change. That's not something they're really used to doing there. They had to do it because they found a bad bearing. Let's watch. Oh, Hoover. It's a pretty one. Tom Hoover, a masterful drive. With a new motor, they tune it up with a 534. 265 miles per hour, which tells everyone that he shut it off a little bit early, not uh, wanting to overtax that brand new engine. Johnny West, a 612 at 178 miles an hour, but all in all, he had a pretty good day. So, an interesting matchup. Young Richard Hartman from California has a shot at his first ever NHRA national title. Veteran Tom Hoover, well, he's won him before, but he is hungry as well. Meanwhile, back in the pits, that is the Pat Austin crew, led by his dad, Walt, getting ready to go against Doug Herbert in the top fuel final. So that's going to be an interesting matchup as well. Two young lions in this sport. Do not adjust your set. That is just the late afternoon sun shining into sparkling Firebird Lake, just adjacent to the drag strip, home of a lot of uh, drag boat races, water ski competitions, and believe it or not, bungee jumping up a crane right into the water. Meantime, we have something a little more sensible, the Pro Stock Final Four. Don Beverly versus Jim Yates. Beverly has the lane choice. Let's see where he's going to go. No surprise for a pro stock car, the near lane, Brock. Well, I'll tell you, Steve, I've got to uh, stick with my old shirt tail relative, Jim Yates, but uh, uh, Don Garlitz, uh, Don Beverly's a real veteran in this kind of competition. He's sitting in an excellent car prepared by Warren Johnson's team, so uh, my pal Jim's got his uh, work cut out for him. But these cars are so evenly matched. They run just within hundredth of a second of each other, round for round. It always boils down almost to a starting line duel who can leave the starting line perfect and sometimes they don't want to stage and do all kind of tricks to try to psych the other driver out to get that advantage and the clutches in the bell housings of these cars now are not the simple one disc model they were just a few years ago they're very complicated uh, similar and designed to top fuel and plenty car and stages and all kinds of things done and most of them maintenance them every round that's right something they didn't used to have to do listen to the rpm scream
Beautiful drag race. And the winner is Don Beverly. Kurt Johnson is crew chief. Like that one, a 733 to 190 to a 739 at 187. But Yates was off the starting line first, so he made it look a little closer than it might have been. That's right, Steve. Beverly was late on the light by just a little. Yates took a very nice starting line advantage, but just didn't have that muscle in mid-course to keep up. Beverly's car ran quicker and faster, even though he was a little late, and that made the difference between a winner and a loser. He never really overpowered the track, just gaining a little bit every inch of the way. Don Beverly, for I believe only the second time in his pro stock career, goes to the final round. Steve, I'll tell you what, if it gets any better than this, I just don't know what it would be. Uh, you know, this, this Warren Johnson, Kurt Johnson, uh, you know, all the guys involved, Big Dave, uh, Greg Anderson, the, the car is, is so good, we've got so much power for a change that this is our second race together, and to tell you, they go to the finals, I couldn't be any happier for myself and for them. The wind bothered the car at all? It did. It was really loose again. It wasn't as bad. I had lane choice this time. I'd like to keep lane choice right now. I'm going to run my ball, see the Jerry Eckman here in a minute. Go get him. Thank you. And that is his boss right there in the other half of the Warren Johnson operation. The front line car, as it were, the one with all the sponsorship on it. Warren Johnson in the far lane against this man, Jerry Ackman, who is on a roll. He's on a terrace, Steve, running really, really well right now. Well, he's got the competition scared to death. Two drivers today have red-lighted against him. He really hasn't had an opponent yet uh, worthy of his Pontiac. He holds the national record. He won at the Winter Nationals. He's got it all. I doubt that Warren Johnson is going to be afraid of him. Warren Johnson had a 720 earlier today, and he is running good. I don't think he's afraid of Ekman in the least. No, I agree with you there for sure. This is the stiffest competition Ekman has had all day. Oldsmobile versus Pontiac. You can see the wind shaking the Christmas tree. It is brisk out there. Good drag race. Warren Johnson having some control problems. Those cars making so much horsepower, they haven't got the clutch really to catch up with it yet. You saw Bill Orndorff as Jerry Eckman wanted. Whoa, just really nice. A 724, another speed over 190 miles per hour. And more important, Steve, that 724 will give Eckman lane choice against Don Beverly. It'll be a Pontiac versus Oldsmobile final in pro stock. Meanwhile, back in the pits, that is one of the Richard Hartman crew working diligently to get ready for Tom Hoover in the funny car final. Here in Phoenix, only three races remain in the Motorcraft Ford Nationals, the Pro Finals, and that is 24-year-old Doug Herbert just walking away from his group as they ready his top fuel. They're going to face 27-year-old Pat Austin. So it's a youthful top fuel final. A couple of veterans, though, in pro stock underway right now. Jerry Eckman smokes the tires, as does Don Beverly, to get him hot and ready. And Don Garlitz, can Eckman be stopped? Well, in my opinion, I don't think so. But, you know, he can make a mistake, and he has been known to red light on occasion, and it can happen at this particular facility. And Don Beverly may have more power because between rounds, they took the Warren Johnson motor out and put it into Beverly's car. Just moments ago, I chatted with both drivers. You know it, I know it. You're a definite underdog. What do you do against Jerry Ekman? Well, I tell you what, we're trying to add a little more horsepower here right now. Uh, Jerry's got a little bit of advantage on us, and... Uh, these guys are working, putting us in a little more power and try to do my job and try to win us a race. That's all we're going to do. What's going through your mind as you get ready to race your opponent? Not a lot. I am uh, I know they're down there changing engines, and uh, I'm just not going to worry about what they're doing. i got to worry about what we're doing. We're getting our car prepared, and uh, it's been working good all day, and that's all I'm going to go in with that thought in my mind that my car is prepared well. Okay, you've heard from both the combatants. All we can do now is watch for the final results. Jerry Eckman in the lane he wants to be. Don Beverly over on the far side where he'd rather actually not be, but he does have the boss's motor now. Let's see. Pro Stock Final, the Motocraft Ford Nationals. Beverly out first, but just like Warren Johnson the round before, too much power. His car is all over the racetrack. Jerry Ekman has won his second NHRA national event in a row with a 726, 190. Don? I'm on the line here with Bill Orndorff, and he is one happy camper. 726, you kept that thing running good all day long, Bill. I tell you, I'm pretty proud. I'm proud of Jerry, I'm proud of my team, and I'm, I'm just tickled pink. I've got my sister and my niece here from California, and it's just pretty special. Well, that's two in a row. 
Yep, and we're planning on some more. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you. Bye now. Brock? All right, Don, uh, as we take another look at uh, what was uh, right off the line, it looked like Don Beverly's race. He had a great launch, uh, good reaction time, but right about here, we see Jerry Ekman and that Pontiac begin to come on real strong, and then it came upon old Don Beverly to just start to wobble there. He goes a little bit uh, toward the center line, corrects, comes out of the throttle for an instant, and that's the end of the race. Jerry Ekman on to his second straight victory. Jerry Ekman, tell us about that race. I think you saw that white car. Yeah, I saw that white car all the way through low gear. He was out on me, and these guys have been taking shots at me, and, uh, you know, that's, they're, that's what happens when you're running well, and uh, I knew one of them was bound to get lucky, and he got out on me pretty good, but this Pennzoil Pontiac with Stratford Motor Products helping out really put it on in the middle of the track, and I'm so thrilled to be here at the finish line as a winner. Two wins in a row and a big lead in the Winston points. Yeah, that's great, and I got to give credit to my crew. Okay, let's go back up to Brock Yates. Well, Steve, that was a great, great uh, drag race for the first eighth mile until Don Beverly's uh, Oldsmobile came unglued under a lot of horsepower. As the uh, two old competitors congratulate each other, we're hearing the rattle of nitro-powered funny car motors as uh, funny car finals come up, and Don Garlitz, the veteran Tom Hoover, you raced against him over the years on and off. Uh, he's, a, he's a good one. He can win this thing. Yes, he is. He comes into this round with a definite performance advantage. Panic on the Hartman team. The car did not do a decent burnout. Richard is now back into the water. Going to try to do a short one. He cannot inconvenience Tom Hoover. He cannot cause Hoover's car to overheat. A burn down in racer's parlance. There's a nice shorty. Earlier I talked to both of these drivers. Richard, what's the plan here? You're in tough and you know it. <laughs> yeah, we're in tough. I'm not sure what he ran, but uh, we're going to... We had a mismatched set of heads on because we're afraid to hurt the engine and we're throwing another head on so the engine will be even out and we'll, we should be back to our 543 in first round deal. Who, Bob, uh, this one can be yours if you don't screw up. That's the name of the game, Steve. Uh, today so far, things are going our way and uh, if we don't beat ourselves or make a big bad mistake, I think we can do it. We're about to find out. 50-year-old Tom Hoover up against a kid less than half his age, Richard Hartman. But as Hoover and the others put it that are into their 50s now, old age and treachery will overcome youth and exuberance any time. We're about to find out. Hoover in the far line, Hartman in the near line. Hoover has earned his way into the final. Hartman's had a lot of luck. And Hartman's luck comes to an end. Can he keep it off the wall? Yes. All the paint is still on the insanity car. Back at the starting line, the Hoover crew deservedly patting each other on the back, receiving congratulations. Tom Hoover has won it at a 527, 263 miles an hour. Don Garlitz with George. 527, he's won another one for you, George. Don't say that, son of ours, because it takes a whole crew to win one of these things. <laughs> right? But he did his job right every time yeah. today, George. And this would be a glorious day for me if my wife was here. Congratulations. Brock? Well, Don, a point in moment. Uh, Ma Hoover having uh, died just less than a month ago and uh, not being here, of course, to watch her son Tom go on to victory here at the Motorcraft Ford Nationals after Richard Hartman gets all over the racetrack and half track. I'll tell you what, Big Daddy, we had fire, we had smoke. The only thing he didn't do was blow the body off that thing. Well, you know, Richard Hartman's love affair with the wall almost came true one more time, but at the very last moment he lifted, he didn't hurt the car, and Tom Hoover went on to another victory. Austin won as recently as the Winston Finals last October to conclude the 91 season. Doug Herbert has never won an event, nor even been in the final round. He is super pumped up. Austin, of course, Brock Gates has the experience on his side, really. Well, Steve, as well, no, Pat Austin ranks second only to Bob Glidden in all-time NHRA championship victory. But I don't think that intimidates Doug Herbert. Earlier, Steve talked to him both. Doug, you're in tough, buddy. Pat Austin is plenty mean. How are you going to handle this race? What are you going to have to do? Well, uh, I don't know what to say. We got, a, we got a quicker car than he does, but he seems to be a little bit more consistent, so we're going to have to get after it a little bit. I think we can do it. Doug Herbert has a fast car. He's proven that. 
How do you approach this race with a first-time finalist like him? You approach it just like that. He has a fast car, and, and he's a good driver. And, and Doug's been on a hot streak. If you watch his car at Pomona, he's, uh, he's right there, and his car is really running good. They slowed down a little bit that time, but we ain't, taking, we ain't even looking at that. We're looking past that, and he's going to run a four-second run, and that's exactly how we're going to approach it. So young Pat Austin and the Austin crew not taking Doug Herbert lightly by any means, Big Daddy, and I think they're right. Well, they got a little bit of advantage right in the bank with Pat Austin. He almost gets everybody out of the gate for a starting line advantage. So that really gives a team confidence when they're setting their clutch and, their, and uh, you know, the different things they have to do that might cause them to spin the tire. Doug Herbert, very cool. He was the last to stage. He breaks right up the starting line. Something happens to Herbert and Pat Austin. Austin at a 506, 286 miles an hour. He was vulnerable, had Herbert not broken. You probably read this track better than anybody today. You always knew which was the best lane and you selected it throughout the competition. I think that comes with the experience of the guys. You know, my dad and the guys that work together and they've been working together real well and I think it's shown our performance. And being a new team, I think it's very important to go out and do good earlier if things can fall apart and we're doing good so far. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you. So Kenny Bernstein won round one in Pomona. Now Pat Austin knocks him out in round two. Brock. And Steve, Doug Herbert was knocked out with a dollar part on the throttle linkage. I'm Brock Gates for Steve Evans and Big Daddy Don Garlitz. Thanks for joining us. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. The American...